Hello everyone, welcome to CS350. This is Karthik Gopalan. In this lecture, we are going to learn about different input-output models. Which This lecture deals with the various ways in which user-level programs can perform I.O. operations and the different models that the operating system provides to these user-level programs. So we begin by a discussion of various types of concurrency. There are primarily two types of concurrency, true concurrency and apparent concurrency. In true concurrency, you have either multiple processes or several kernel level threads. And these threads or processes can make, pro um, can make progress independently of each other. So these are essentially independent flows of execution whose scheduling is controlled by the operating system kernel. True concurrency can be found commonly in multiprocessor or multi-CPU machines where you, each CPU can execute a different process or a different thread. Even if you have a single CPU in the system, as long as the kernel supports multiple process or multiple threads, you can have true concurrency. The key property in this situation is that if one of the threads or processes blocks, then the other thread or processes can make forward progress in their execution. In, in the apparent concurrency case, we have only a single thread or a single process that juggles multiple tasks. As we learned earlier in the course, this type of model is also known as event-driven execution model. So in this case, the user or external observer gets an illusion that there is concurrent activity going on whereas in reality a single thread or a single process is dividing up its time among multiple tasks in a very quick fashion. So uh, you might see apparent concurrency when you use the select system call to handle input output on multiple IO devices. We will learn about the select system call later in this slide. You also see apparent concurrency when you have user level threads that is threads that are not supported by the operating system. So here's an example of true concurrency. You have a server process that might be servicing certain remote clients over the network. Whenever a client connection arrives, the listening server or the primary server, it would fork a child process and the child process would take over the uh, processing of the client requests. And whenever another client contacts the primary server, then the primary server would fork another child server and the second child server will process the second client and so on. So in this case, you have multiple server processes and each server process is responsible for a separate task. The different server processes are executing independent of each other. So even if one server process blocks, for example, in this case, the listening server is blocked waiting for new connections. Even in this case, the other server processes can make forward progress in processing other clients. So here's an example of apparent concurrency. There's a single server process that's using select system call to monitor input and output on multiple file descriptors. Each file descriptor may be used to process connections with different remote clients. So in order to process multiple clients, the select system call uh, returns back whenever any IO activity is ready on one of the clients. And at that point, the concurrent server process that client. However, while, a con while the server is processing one client, it is unable to process other clients. So in that sense, it is similar to event-driven programming. Essentially, we will see later in this lecture that such type of programs have a giant for loop which constantly pulls the various IO descriptors using the select system call and processes their events one at a time. This brings us to our core discussion of the different IO models. There are five IO models, blocking, non-blocking, IO multiplexing, signal driven, and asynchronous. We are most familiar with the blocking IO model, which is the default IO model provided by the operating system. Other IO models are usually used to gain some sort of efficiency over the default option. So we will be comparing 
all the different IO models in the rest of this lecture. <clears throat> Before we get into the details of the IO models, let's first look at the various steps involved in the IO operations. So in this example, we have data arriving into a kernel buffer. Um, either the data can arrive over the network or from, um, from an IO device, or it can also arrive locally from another process. Once the data arrives into the kernel buffer, then it is copied into a user level application process. So the second step, you're already familiar with this through assignments. This is often called copy to user operation, where data is copied from a kernel buffer to user space. So we are primarily distinguishing different IO models based on these two stages of IO operation, data arrival into the kernel buffer and copying data into user space. The way these two stages are handled by different IO models distinguishes these IO models. So also you note that we are primarily talking about data arrival or reading data from an IO device. We are not particularly worried about writing data to an IO device. This is because when you write data to an IO device, the data is often first buffered in the kernel. For example, if you're writing to a file, then the data would first go to the file system cache and, and there it will be buffered and the user will return immediately to do other operations. The dirty data would be committed from the file system cache to the disk at a later time. This type of buffered write operation usually reduces the latency of write operations. So at least the latency seen by the end user. As a result, we are primarily distinguishing different IO models by the way in which read operations are differentiated. Note that it's important to differentiate between read operations because uh, the user pro level program cannot progress without reading a particular piece of data. If you need a piece of data to do some computation, then you have to read it first. And until the data arrives in the user space at the, through the second, second stage of this operation, till then the user level process cannot make progress. With this in mind, let's look at the first IO model called blocking IO model. In the blocking IO model, the application performs a read or receive operation and then it blocks for a long time. And once um, the application returns from the read or receive operation, at that point the data is available in user space buffers. So, so during both the stages, data arrival into the kernel space and copying the data from kernel to user space, during both of these stages, the application is blocked and it's not making progress. In the meantime, on the right hand side, you would notice what the operating system is doing. When the read system call is made by the application, control goes to the operating system. The operating check system checks its internal buffers to see if the data is available. If the data is not available, then the operating system puts the calling process in a blocked state. What this means is that the process would be removed from the running state, moved into a waiting queue, and some other process would be scheduled on the CPU. The OS doesn't block, however, the process blocks. At some point, the data will arrive into the kernel buffer. That's the first stage of the IO operation. At that point, the OS will check all the processes that are blocked for the data, and it will wake them up. Once the process is woken up, data will be copied from the kernel buffer into the user space. That's the second stage, which refers to copy data to user space. So once the copy is complete, the, the control is returned back to the user space program. During both of these stages, the uh, calling process was blocked. Hence, this model is known as the blocking IO model. Now, we, we, let's say that we don't want to block in both the phases. Instead, we want to we want to allow the process to perform some useful work while it is waiting for data. So an option to the blocking IO model is called the non-blocking IO model. In the non-blocking IO model, <coughs> um, we again have two stages, but the first stage of the IO operation is non-blocking. What this means is that 
if the application makes a read call to the operating system, operating system would check if the data is available. If it's not available, then instead of blocking, the OS would return back to the user space with an error. In this case, the E would block error tells the application that the data is not available and in, in a blocking mode, this call would have blocked. So, so the application has to check for this error and, and then later try again. So application can go on, do other things, and after some time it can come back and try for the data availability again. So essentially during the first phase, the application constantly keeps checking with the operating system. Is the data available? Is the data available? And so on. So at some point, the data comes into the operating system's buffer. At that point, the calling process would block. This is the second stage of the I operation. And the calling process would be blocked till the data is copied from the kernel space to user space. So note that in non-blocking I.O. model, it is not strictly a non-blocking model in the sense that only the first stage is non-blocking. The second stage is in fact blocking. But since the second stage, copy, copying data to user space, usually takes a very small amount of time, we do not consider this model to be fully blocking. So for most practical purposes, we consider this model to be non-blocking. This model is also known as a polling model because the first stage involves the application to, requires the application to constantly check with the operating system whether the data is available or not. So <clears throat> let's now look at another IO model called IO multiplexing which was the apparent concurrency model that we just discussed. In this model, you have a single server which is handling multiple I.O. descriptors and um, it, is, it needs to handle the I.O. operations and all of these descriptors. So, so how do we do this without having multiple threads, one for each of the connection? The way this is done is using the select system call. IO multiplexing is somewhat similar to the blocking IO model that we just saw. In the blocking IO model, the calling process was waiting for one IO operation at a time. In the IO multiplexing model, the calling process can wait for multiple IO operations at a time. So in this case, the calling application will use select system call to block on multiple file descriptors simultaneously. So when the application makes a select system call, it asks the operating system to monitor for data availability on any file descriptor among a list of file descriptors that it specifies. So in the select system call, the default behavior is that the process would block while the operating system is checking for data availability. If none of the file descriptors is ready for data, then the calling process would be put, put in a blocking state and some other process would be scheduled on the CPU. Once any of the file descriptors is ready with data, then the operating system returns back from the select system call. At this point, the application enters the second stage. It would check each of the file descriptors for data availability and uh, based on the return value from select system call, it would check each descriptor for data availability. And whichever descriptor is ready for IO operations, it, the calling application would then perform read or receive system call on that file descriptor. So the second stage where the calling process calls the read system call, that, that stage is blocking because it involves copying the data from kernel space to user space. So. So in this model, the first stage you're blocking on multiple file descriptors in one shot together. You don't block on individual file descriptors one at a time. Whereas in the second stage, there's reading data, you have to copy data from each file descriptor one at a time. So the first stage is a cumulative blocking, whereas the second stage involves blocking on each file descriptor independently. The next I.O. model is called signal-driven I.O. model. Here we want to improve upon the 
second IO model that we saw, so the non-blocking IO model. In the non-blocking IO model, we were constantly asking the application to poll the operating system for data availability. But let's say that you want to avoid the hassle of polling the operating system. With signal-driven I.O., an application can set up a SIG-I.O. signal handler, and it can tell the operating system that whenever data is available, send me a signal. So, so in this case, once the application establishes a SIG-I.O. signal handler, uh, the operating system checks if data is available. If not, it returns back to the application. The process continues to do something else in the meantime. The first stage is not blocking. When data is available in the kernel, the operating system delivers a SIGIO signal to the user space. At this point, a signal handler will be called, which informs the application that the data is available. At some point, the application calls the read or receive call on the file descriptor, and the second stage will again be blocking, and while the data is being copied from kernel space to user space. So, so this is similar to the non-blocking I.O. model in the sense that the first stage is not blocking and the second stage is blocking. However, the difference is that in the first stage, for non-blocking I.O., you are constantly polling the operating system, whereas for signal-driven I.O., the process doesn't need to poll. The, the operating system will automatically inform the application when data is available. Finally, we come to the fifth IO model, which is the asynchronous IO model. In this model, we do not want application to block either during the first stage or the second stage. In some high-performance computing system, even the overhead of copying data from kernel to user space can be significant enough that people want to optimize out that overhead. So, in this model, an application will call an AIO read system call. This would ask the operating system to monitor the availability of data and copy it to user space. In the meantime, the application continues doing something else. The operating system would wait for the data on behalf of the application. It wouldn't exactly wait, but it would monitor the availability of data um, for, on behalf of the application. Once the data arrives, the data would be copied into a user space buffer. And once the data has been copied, at that point, a signal will be delivered to the user space application. And in the signal handler, the application can then read the data from the buffer to which OS has already copied the data. So, uh, so from application's perspective, when a signal is delivered, the data is already there in user space buffer. So there is no need to perform any blocking. So this is the purest form of non-blocking I.O. model. Um, unfortunately, most operating systems don't support pure AIO read or pure asynchronous I.O. operation because the benefits for common commodity users um, of optimizing out the second phase are very little, but it adds significant complexity to the operating system to add, to, to make the second phase truly non-blocking. Uh, you note that in order to, for the I/O operation to be truly non-blocking, uh, the app operating system needs a pointer to user space buffer. So you have to rely on multiple uh, multiple conditions in order for the AI asynchronous I/O to be successful. First is that the user space pointer should still be valid when the kernel tries to copy data to user space. Second is that the application shouldn't do something wrong with user space pointers. And finally, the operating system shouldn't swap out the corresponding page from memory uh, so that when copying data to user space, you have to swap things back in. All of these problems can be individually solved, but solving them takes adds significant complexity to the kernel. So most commodity operating systems may not support asynchronous I.O. Uh, even though you may find a system call called AIO read, but usually the behavior will be similar to a signal driven IO model. Um, some high performance computing systems may support true asynchronous IO as needed. Finally, let's take a quick look at the IO multiplexing model and uh, some of the details of how IO multiplexing model may be implemented. This is an example of the event oriented or event-driven programming that we had discussed 
in the under the threads chapter so as we discussed earlier io multiplexing is used when a single thread or a process needs to handle multiple uh, io operations and multiple file descriptors when io on any one descriptor um, can result in blocking then we want to use io multiplexing to block on multiple descriptors at the same time so again this is the same figure as we saw earlier where a single server is monitoring multiple file descriptors for IO operations and it uses a select system call to monitor for events on these file descriptors. So the select system call, it allows a process to wait for events to occur on any one of its descriptors. There are three types of events, read, write and exception conditions. So if you want to read uh, data from a particular IO device, then that would be a read IO operation. If you want to check for check whether a device is ready to accept write operations then that would be uh, a write event and if you want to monitor error conditions on an IO device then that would be an exception condition. So, uh, so, so here's the prototype of the select system call. The, the, although the arguments look complicated but you should mainly focus on the second, third and fourth um, uh, fourth arguments. These arguments correspond to uh, a set of file descriptors that you want to monitor for different I/O operation. So read FDS argument is a set of file descriptors you want to monitor for read operations. Write FDS is a set of file descriptors you want to monitor for write operations and the third one is for exceptions. And finally there is a timeout value that you can specify which can control how long you want the select system call to block. Um, a value of null means that uh, you want the select system call to block indefinitely till an I operation is ready. And a value of zero means that, uh, means that you want the select system call to have a non-blocking behavior or a polling behavior. So note that select system call can actually take a range of behaviors from pure blocking to pure non-blocking or to anything in between. For example, you can specify a five second timeout value to specify that the select system call should block for five seconds and then return back to the user space. So there are also a set of macros that are provided by alongside the select system call to test for the availability of IO operations on different file descriptors. I won't get into the programming details here, but feel free to check the man pages to, to, to understand the details of these descriptors, of these macros. So here's an example of a program, which is a non-forking concurrent server. Here we want to monitor the read and write operations on certain descriptors. There are, uh, there are three descriptors, listen, descript, uh, listen FD, which, is, which refers to a listening socket descriptor for a connection on the network, a connection FD, two connection FD descriptors which monitor for IO operations on already established TCP connections. Um, <clears throat> so the main loop here is an infinite for loop and ignoring the rest of the details for a while you'll see that there is a select system call in which you specify the read, read set and the write set. The set of files on which you want to monitor read operations and the set of files on your, which you want to monitor write operations. So if you look at the FD underscore set macros at the beginning of the for loop, you would notice that the read set contains connection FD1 and listen FD. This means that you want to monitor these two descriptors for read operation. Acceptance of a new connection usually qualifies as a read operation. Um, and you want to monitor connection FD2 for write operation. So the select system call would block till an IO operation is ready on one of these descriptors. Then you would you have a sequence of if statements where you're checking for the occurrence of specific events. So the first if statement checks if there is a read, uh, if there is data available to be read on connection FD1. If so, you would go ahead and make the read system call to read the data. Similarly, the, the second and third if statements check for corresponding 
IO events on those descriptors. So if you find that a specific descriptor was set for a specific event, then you would invoke the corresponding read or write system call on that descriptor. So this is a typical event-driven programming model. If you remember our discussion from the third lecture, uh, there was a large while loop in which you had a bunch of if statements, if event one, then do task one, if event, if event two, then do task two. So this is exactly the same model where you're checking different descriptors for IO events and you're taking some corresponding tasks. You're invoking some corresponding task for those events. So this is just to give you some idea about what uh, the IO multiplexing model looks like. You don't have to remember the programming details. You can always look it up through the man pages or through help from the internet. Uh, but in case you have to you ever use the IO multiplexing model in the future, you know where to look for now. This brings us to the end of the lecture on IO models. Again, feel free to ask me any questions.